Ow. Ah, uh, Filippo, you're going to have to say something so we know when you're when you're in the window. If you could say something right now. Yes, yes, ready, ready to go, ready. I I look forward receiving your your cowbell. <laughs> Still silence. Dear colleagues, I'm Filippo Crea, Editor-in-Chief of the European Art Journal. Welcome to our monthly dialogue. I remind you that uh, our dialogues are free and live streamed in uh, YouTube. And the dialogue, I remind you, is uh, the last Thursday of each month. It is interactive, it is free and interactive. So please ask questions and uh, we'll give you answers. And now it is today my privilege uh, to ask Professor Julinda Meilli, who is Associate Editor of the European Art Journal, to introduce the important, very important guest we have today, Roxana Meran. Uh, I, I know that she's famous in, in the five continents and I'm really uh, grateful to Roxana for accepting my invitation and also for accepting a very interesting title uh, she will discuss with us. And the title of the dialogue today is Women and Cardiovascular Disease, Challenges and Opportunities Discussed with a Protagonist. And Roxana is a true protagonist. And now, Julinda, please introduce Roxana for our audience, and then we will start with our questions. Thank you, Filippo, for giving me the possibility to be here in this dialogue and to present Roxana Meran, which is for me uh, not only a big friend, but also a mentor, and um, for everybody, a well known scientist and interventional cardiologist. Roxana, you have to excuse me because you have such a long uh, curriculum that I need to read it. I cannot say it by heart. So Roxana Meran, a lot of titles, is Professor of Medicine and Director of Interventional Cardiovascular Research and Clinical Trials at the Jena and Michael Weiner Cardiovascular Institute at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. She completed her training in internal medicine at the University of Connecticut where she was also a chief medical resident before continuing her fellowship in cardiovascular disease and interventional cardiology at Mount Sinai Medical Center. Roxana Meran is internationally recognized for her work in clinical trials with a very complex data analysis and outcome research within the field of interventional cardiology. And I'm happy to say that she is not only the woman making research for women, but is the women interventional cardiologists and researchers who makes in, um, research for all people in cardiology, for all patients in cardiology, without gender differences, racial differences, or minorities. Roxana Meran has an excellent experience and expertise in working with regulatory agencies to conduct clinical trials. Her research interest expands from mechanism of restenosis to treatment and prevention of acute kidney injuries in cardiac patients and advanced treatment for acute coronary syndrome and acute myocardial infarction, and now recently for structural heart disease. In addition to founding a highly regarded academic research organization within the Cardiovascular Research Foundation, she is also a widely published author and frequently invited speaker at national and international scientific conferences such as AJ, ACC, European Society of Cardiology, Euro PCR, Otavi, London. She has served as course co-director at the TCT for the last 30 years. She serves in many editorial boards of multiple peer-reviewed journals. She currently serves, serves on the board of trustees of Sky as a member of the program committee for American Heart Association scientific sessions, as a member of the board of directors for Harboring Hearts, and as program chair for Society of Cardiac Angiography and Interventions Initiative. She was the founder of SkyWin, 
which was the first organization for interventional cardiologists, women interventional cardiologists, which was also our example for the EIPCI women in European Society of Cardiology. She's also the chief scientific officer of the Clinical Trial Center at the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. So Roxana, you have such a long curriculum, so many things, but I'm very interested to hear for you a personal question. So you, have, you were born in Tehran and grew up as cardiologist in America, in the United States. Your wish and your dream to become medical doctor, to become a physician, started in Tehran or in on the United States? Oh, it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, obviously, um, I have deep roots uh, from Iran in Tehran, and I'm proud uh, to be an Iranian American now that I've been here for over 40 years, and it's been a fantastic ride. But I would say that my um, my zeal for medicine probably started way back when, even in Iran, uh, where um, there has been incredible, incredible scholars in medicine there. And, and, and of course, I felt uh, as one of the first members of my family to kind of go into medicine because most of our family was mostly in, um, in either the government or in law or philosophy or poetry. It was, uh, it was kind of something uh, rebellious, if you will, for a woman. And when I came to the United States, um, those, um, those incredible um, seeds sort of became part of uh, planting those seeds uh, in science and, and maths and studying those where I felt very strong uh, with that. And it was easier as, a, as an immigrant who didn't speak English to excel in math because mm -hmm. math and science have no um, language, right? We, we, can, we can learn it in any language. And so it was sort of uh, how, how I excelled in, in high school without speaking English, being able to really, really do well in those subjects. So I was gravitated there. And then my brother uh, became ill with um, glomerular nephritis. She, he was 11 and we almost lost him. And I spent many nights in the hospital with him and that's when I knew that um, it was the place for me because it was a place where you could put evidence together and use it as sort of a puzzle and solve the puzzle that then saves lives. And uh, he's now 50 plus years old and doing extremely well with two children. And um, so it's sort of what medicine can do. And, and I was um, obviously extremely dedicated after that to make sure that I could, and maybe that's why I'm still interested in kidney injury and, and renal disease because of uh, what happened with my own brother. But why did you select it cardiology, which triggers your business? I mean, I think cardiology was sort of like a natural fit for me because um, I'm, um, a, a, as I said, I'm a problem solver. And I think in cardiology, you get to the answer. I guess I'm I'm a little bit, I would say, um, impatient. I like answers right away. And I think in cardiology, especially in the cath lab and especially in treating patients with acute myocardial infarction and critically ill patients, you get the results right away. And I, and I felt that really empowering, but as well as seeing all of the science and the research that went into uh, cardiology, uh, I was very lucky to be there in a very early time of PCI. So I got to see the evolution of PCI. Uh, and I think, you know, um, you were there too, Dulinda. You, you also contributed so much to the field uh, by your research and your work. And it was obviously exciting to be there at that time. And, and I think we were very lucky uh, mm -hmm. to be able to, to go into this field. What, what was your biggest achievement in your career? I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I don't want to just kind of say that, uh, what are my achievements? It's the achievements in cardiology. And I think we all need to kind of feel really good about our field, uh, especially interventional cardiology. It's such a rewarding field. And that's why I think we need to attract more women to it, because I think it's such a fantastic field. And collectively, we can do so much uh, in improving uh, the lives of our patients, both in quality and quantity. And I think that uh, when you think about some of the things that we have done, like for example, um, 
understanding of the issues with very early on with uh, instant restenosis, and then um, really pushing that this was going to be a big issue, especially if you had diffuse instant restenosis and the patterns of instant restenosis, and really pushing it out there. And now we don't see restenosis. We talked about acute kidney injury very early on with the risk score uh, and and understanding that we needed to take preventive measures. It used to be at 20%. Now it's in the, in, you know, a few percentage, four or 5% because we're taking care. When um, we started to see data that, yes, if you push antiplatelets and you're doing so well with your stents, maybe you're pushing the, the envelope too far and that now we have to think about bleeding. And, and of course, now we're looking at bleeding avoidance strategies. So I think what this is, is a collective way of making observations, finding problems, addressing them, putting them out there, talking about the limitations of our therapeutic regimens, and then finding innovative approaches to improve the health outcomes of our patients. And I think for me, that's the most rewarding. Mm. Did you have any difficult moment in your career? Every day is a difficult moment <laughs> in a career. The most difficult moment at all. Do you have Every one? Day. I think, I think, you know, um, look, I think um, where where I started and you came, you're a lot younger than me, Julinda, so I'm not uh, mm-hmm. doing that, but I think, you know, um, we had it very tough. I mean, when I first came out, uh, I was one of the very few, a handful of interventional cardiologists who were women. Uh, we weren't taken seriously. We worked a lot harder. I remember um, being pregnant and sleeping under my desk and not going home. I remember uh, delivering my child and coming to work uh, with the wristband still on my hand uh, after delivering my child. Um, I remember a lot of difficult times and, uh, we, we had to, we had to be smarter, work harder. Um, we had to just do twice as much and still not get the recognition. So yes, those are difficult moments. And you could say, well, you know what, this will never work. And now I think the tsunami, I think it was the tsunami back then for us (laughs) as women. And I think now we're, um, we're in, we're in a better place, but I don't think we have walked the walk yet. I think we have maybe picked up the big rocks, but there's still gravel on the, on the ground. There's still a lot of unknown obstacles for women. And I think that um, sometimes um, if you get rocks in your shoes, you can't go very far, maybe a flat surface. But if you always have rocks in your shoes, you're never going to go as fast as someone with a beautiful, perfect, um, you know, path and great shoes with no, not even gravel. And I think a lot of women walk with rocks in their feet, in their, in their, uh, in their shoes. And so therefore they have to work harder, uh, be more resilient, uh, continue to, um, uh, you know, outsmart their colleagues and have to work a lot harder to be recognized. Um, It's gotten a lot better. I I can't say that it's as bad as what it was before. I was lucky because I was, um, I was one of the lucky few. I had Marty Leon who, um, who really, really recognized my talent and uh, put me on the stage and he made sure he walked away from the stage, but he stood behind me, making sure if I fell off, he was there to push me up again. And that's what we all must do for all of our uh, talented men and women who are working with us, our mentees. Uh, And I think he was the quintessential mentor that made me uh, believe in myself and uh, also gave me uh, the stage uh, that was necessary. And of course, all of the important opportunities. Roxana, thank you for your answers, uh, but you are not only a top scientist and top cardiologist, you also devoted uh, a lot of efforts in addressing the issue of uh, sex and gender-based inequities in cardiovascular medicine. 
and you are really an example for, for all of us, but what triggered your interest in this specific issue? Well, it's sort of like anything else, right? When you start to see um, that, uh, of course, um, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death and me of men and women. And of course, four decades ago, we were doing terrible for women. We had all these awareness uh, campaigns that continued to improve uh, and reduce uh, the uh, cardiovascular events in women. But then uh, we began forgetting about that again. And uh, there was a decline in that, uh, um, there, was a, there was a slowing of that decline over the last decade. But I've been watching that from the time, of course, I'm a woman and I always care about women. Um, I noticed that uh, one of the first times that I noticed that there was disparities of care is when I was a medical student in University of Connecticut, when I was there as rotating through in one of the very, very busy hospitals in Hartford, Connecticut. And in the emergency department there, I was rotating and uh, I was a medical student and there were two, um, two patients, a man and a woman, um, both complaining of chest pain, both having nausea and vomiting and um, my supervisor told me that I should go see the man first because he's probably having an MI and she's probably just <laughs> anxious. And I, w I went and I, of course, believed him. And I went and I saw the man who was having a gastrointestinal upset. And the woman behind me waited another hour with her tombstone SD segment elevation myocardial infarction. I will never forget that. And that just really upset me in a way that I felt that I was doing the wrong thing, that I, how did I not uh, pay attention to that? And, I, and then I realized that the implicit bias that we all facing in our workplace also, also is there for women. Uh, and of course, we've always thought about coronary disease and heart attacks in the elderly female population because we felt like they were protected by their estrogen. But of course, we're now seeing a, a rise in acute coronary syndromes, acute myocardial infarction in women less than the age of 55 years, less than the age of 45 years. And we're now finally understanding all of these different pathobiological mechanisms that you at EHJ have done a great job in uh, putting on papers on Monoka, Anoka, SCAD, Takotsubo, um, uh, microvascular dysfunction, vasospasm. No, women are not crazy. They're actually having symptoms and they're actually at risk for cardiovascular events. And so of course those things really sparked my interest. And, um, and then uh, I started writing about it. And then of course the bleeding issues being so prominent in women in PCI, and then us not always finding a bad outcome in our, in our female patients and everyone saying it's because they're studded with risk, that's why. And then we start to see some real issues in under treatment, under diagnosis, under recognition of symptoms in women. Um, and then came the commission from the Lancet, which was, I think, um, the icing on the cake to be able to really, really dive in deeply and, and answer those questions and hopefully put a put action plans in place instead of talking about these things. Well, thank you for raising the important role of microvascular dysfunction, spasm in women. As you know, this is one of my interests. And also we have a question from Paolo Angelini uh, raising this issue, the importance of uh, microvascular dysfunction and spasm in women. But I'd like to come back to this very, very interesting initiative, uh, the Lancet Initiative, Women and Cardiovascular Disease. So you are the leader of this commission. What, uh, I, mean, I mean, is something which has already been fully developed or is a work in progress? And if it is a work in progress, what will be your next aim in this setting? Well, the commission um, was a four-year project, honestly. Four years ago, um, the Lancet um, uh, editors-in-chief asked me to lead this commission 
with a which is a global commission of understanding the global burden of cardiovascular disease in women um, and in identifying what were those um, existing evidence and gaps in cardiovascular research, treatment, access to care, prevention for women. And um, we assembled 17 world experts, all women, and they always ask me, why, why is this all women? And I, I, my answer is, so don't ask that question because that really makes me upset because when we always have authors 17, 20 male authors. No one ever asks, why are these authors all men? So these were, we gathered the best experts and they just happened to be women. And we'd love to have more male experts in the area of um, cardiovascular disease in women. But for, for whatever reason, um, the most, uh, the, the, the amazing experts were mostly, were women. And we were very happy to have 17 women from around the globe. And, and then of course the aims uh, is to reduce the global burden of cardiovascular disease in the next decade. And for us to promote cardiovascular health and improve the health outcomes of women by evaluating what the gaps are, igniting uh, the awareness of sex and gender differences and disparities and providing a springboard for future research um, and, and really kind of coming back every year for a, with a big progress report. We're gonna be working very closely with the IHME uh, for the Global Burden of Disease Group at the University of Washington and um, uh, continuing with a live website that allows us to get real-time data into that website that gives you the opportunity to understand what those risk factors are in different parts of the globe and how, what are the lowest hanging fruits and how can we address these disparities right away to hope, hopefully make an impact. Thank you, Roxana. And uh, continuing uh, in, this, uh, in this direction, if we want to be more analytical, uh, we can identify three main areas in which sex and gender-based inequities uh, can be observed. Uh, one is authorship, as you said before. Uh, the other is enrollment of women in trials, and then differences in clinical practice, the way we uh, treat men and women. Can you share with us your views in these three settings, authorship, enrollment in trials, and clinical practice? So let me, I mean, let me start with the enrollment in clinical trials, because I think that's a really, really important one. For whatever reason, even though there's been legislation in the United States passed in the 1980s and 90s that mandate inclusion of women, we are still, women are still underrepresented in majority of cardiovascular clinical trials. Now, why is that? Probably because we put these very tight inclusion and exclusion criteria that then excludes women, you know? So uh, that's one of them. And, and the second one is that we don't really uh, work hard to uh, find ways to bring the information of the clinical trials to women. Now, if you remember, when you see a patient usually, and if you wanna bring them into a clinical trial, if you ask the guy, he says, well, I'll have to see what my wife says. I, I can't, I, I gotta make sure she agrees that I should be on this. And women are always the ones who are making decisions for the health of the family. Unfortunately, they put themselves last and they're usually not even asked or asked to participate. We also have an issue that even though we are underrepresented in clinical trials, women are, whenever we have clinical trials, the sex specific data are underreported. Um, and we don't report them. And I think one of the things that journals could do is say, we can't look at this unless you at least put in the appendix or something, the sex specific data. We need to see those. We need to understand that this is also relevant for women. And all of this limits our potential to develop innovative approaches. And when you see a slowing of the decline of morbidity, mortality in women and an increase in acute myocardial infarction, it's because we don't know what to do for microvascular dysfunction. We don't know what to do for Minoka and Anoka because we never diagnosed it in the past and we never thought about 
the therapeutic regimens around it. So we need to really, really work on this. And we, in the commission, we put out a, a very good way, some, some advice, be more inclusive, uh, uh, make sure that trial participation is, is or the trials are well um, uh, 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 communicated to the, to the clinicians who are taking care of women who might be having patients who fit into the clinical trials, not just cardiologists. Remember, women often don't go to cardiologists. They're cared for by general practitioners, OBGYN. Sometimes, you know, they just don't go to cardiologists because they're under, uh, underseen there. And then, of course, removing the, um, removing the inclusion and exclusion criteria and then going to places where women are frequented. This might be, you know, the example is the barbershop for black males, right? You went there and were able to figure out a hypertension treatment for black males in the United States. And for, for women, it may be um, churches or where there, um, for young women, where there is uh, child care or whatever it is in, in, in different places that we have to figure out where they are and, and, and go there. And then of course, continuing this educational campaign. In terms of authorship, I think um, our editors in chief can do a better job in making sure that reviewers are number one. Um, one of the things that happens is that when women send their, their paper, uh, and this happens in basic science, there's a lot of, a lot of research on this. Um, and I know a lot about it because we're, we've been writing about it, is that the reviewers are tougher on, on women. And they give you such a huge, huge review process that it just, like you look at that when it comes back, reviewer two, you know, that reviewer two, everybody knows reviewer number two. And you just look at that and you go, I can't do this. I, I, I just, I'll never be able to get this done. Forget it. They just never go through it. So I have asked that um, reviewers remain blinded to who the authors are. Um, especially the because you could kind of figure out the gender or the the sex of the of the first author, and then of course to kind of really push your uh, agenda forward is to make sure that authors are being fair to their um, younger um, uh, colleagues who have done a lot of the work. Often we see women do a lot of the legwork, even put the first draft of the manuscript. Um, and, and, and never get, you know, maybe they get a middle authorship somewhere and don't get the prominent authorship position. There has to be rules and regulations that are set forth and the journals could kind of make sure that authors are attesting to these rules so that there isn't this issue of mentors, uh, you know, taking away the credit from the mentees who happen to be women. So authorship is very important. And then of course, leadership. If we don't get authorship, it's very hard to get leadership. Uh, a lot of the academic leadership positions are, are based on the fact that have, how many authorship positions have you had that have been either senior or first or second author. So if you're not an author, you're gonna have a hard time getting promoted. And I think women, um, even though they're working hard, they often have imposter syndrome. They feel like, oh my God, I can't be that good. Um, and so therefore they're shy and they won't negotiate for their leadership position. And um, these gaps continue to remain, unfortunately. What about clinical practice? You said before, two patients with the same symptoms, a man with myocardial infarction and a lady with anxiety. Uh, other more general comments on this issue, different ways we treat men and women and in which settings in particular? You believe yeah, I, think, I think we've seen it a lot. I mean, I think, um, for example, um, when a woman bleeds, uh, we've seen this very, very interesting um, sex and, and gender disparity that if a, the bleeding patient is a woman, you stop statins, you stop it in all of them, but much more often in, in women, statins, beta blocks, that has nothing to do with bleeding, but you just kind of stop treating them. You like hands off, I, this per patient, this, this little old lady, don't touch her because she'll bleed or, and, and, and some, something happens, some event happens to that woman, we stop treating them. I don't know why that is, but I, I see it over and over again. 
Referral for angiography often will find reasons uh, not to refer patients to angiography. And, you know, honestly, I mean, I think in structural heart, and Jolinda could talk about this because she's a, a prominent uh, and incredible um, operator with, uh, with structural heart disease, so much better than me. I, I don't perform structural heart intervention, but I think um, really we're seeing that, that the benefit is so greater of these lesser invasive uh, treatments, yet we less often see them referred for, for TAVR or even valve replacements or left atrial appendage closure or PFO closure or any uh, mitral or tricuspid valve treatments. So it's unfortunate, but I think that's just the way it is. Uh, Roxana, I'm proud to mention that uh, in our editorial board, uh, we had five women in the previous editorial board, and now they are 25. So I think Beautiful. we are on the right, on the right track. And Julinda, who is smiling today with us, really is a wonderful associate editor. And uh, women, these 25 women in the editorial board are extremely active, and really I'm grateful to, to all of them. Before asking uh, uh, Julinda to come back to you with other questions, uh, um, I'm reading a message from a colleague, uh, Sok Janket from Boston. It's about uh, a topic which was very popular some years ago, estrogen replacement treatment. There was a wave of interest because we are thought to be protective, uh, but then trials showed the opposite. What is now the trend in the States? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um... I, I agree with, uh, with our colleague in Boston that maybe some injustice for the women in the world in, uh, has been done with some of these, um, the, the Women's Health Initiative. I hate to, to go against that, but I think at the end of the day, um, right now at the moment, uh, hormone replacement therapy is, is not there for protection of, the, of, of a patient for cardiovascular uh, morbidity, mortality. Yet, I think one of the things that we have to do is to understand that uh, in certain women, um, it's absolutely fine to use them, uh, especially for symptom control. The other very important, uh, I think um, we, we also point this out in our commission, is that the number one risk factor, if we were to make the most, the biggest impact on reducing cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in women, it would be identification and treatment of hypertension. So I can just tell you that hypertension is one of the most important areas that we absolutely must pay attention to. Women are not diagnosed with hypertension. Just today before here, I saw three women in my office, all with undiagnosed hypertension. I was the first person who has um, basically diagnosed hypertension. And they've been to endocrinologists and several other places. And they said, well, they never took my blood pressure or they never told me I had high blood pressure. And they told me, oh, it's because you're in my office, you, you don't have high blood pressure. And so, you know, there is a very, very important, um, important initiative that needs to happen as um, our diets and exercise have gotten worse, especially with the pandemic. Uh, hypertension is truly an epidemic right now uh, in around the world. And so we need to kind of get our arms around that and, and take care of that. Thank you, Roxana. I invite our colleagues uh, sending us questions because uh, Roxana will address your questions if, you, if we receive them. And now, Julinda, I'm sure we have many more questions for, for Roxana. It's a very good opportunity today to have her, to have Roxana with us. for such a long time. Thank yeah. you, Roxana, again. Thank Julinda, you. please. So, Roxana, I know that you have done a lot, not only for investigating gender and sex-related differences in, in patient cardi cardiovascular patients, but also investigating the reasons for women being, let's say, um, not very supported in the leadership position also investigating these sex and gender-based differences in leadership. So my question to you is, first, we, everybody knows this, there is a gender-related difference in leaderships in cardiovascular medicine and in medicine uh, everywhere. 
And what do you think, what are the reasons that they're for and how can we change this picture? Well, thank you. Thank you, Julinda. You know, I've been talking a lot about this and I think one of the things that uh, we're, we're very lucky at the moment that uh, our societies, European Society of Cardiology, American College of Cardiology, I sit on the board of trustees of the American College of Cardiology uh, at the moment, uh, as well as the American Heart Association. They're all completely committed in the equal representation, certainly at the scientific meetings, which will help promote leadership uh, and recognition of women in leadership positions by having these important roles in the scientific sessions so that we will never again see a panel in any of these meetings that are completely male or with no, um, with no exercise whatsoever of looking for the female expert for that specific topic. And all of that is changing. But I think it needs more than just that kind of an initiative. I think it needs to be, um, and, I, and I think that all of this uh, was sparked by the Time's Up movement that happened in, the, um, in, the, in Hollywood, really, honestly. And I will say that we've been talking about this for years and years. And, um, and I think that um, when, when the microaggressions and some of the harassments that also included sexual harassments were brought to fruition, that brought women down and made them feel less than what they were uh, in terms of their knowledge and their uh, ability. Uh, I think that became a very, very important springboard for so many other initiatives, especially in medicine. Uh, and we've seen uh, that that tide has really been very, very helpful for this next generation of amazing women who are finding a home in cardiovascular, cardiovascular specialties. And I think this is just wonderful. But as you know, I've been very committed to this cause because I feel like, you know, in life, if you don't give back, like if I'm not gonna speak up about this, who's going to? We need to, all of us need to um, put up this flag and say, we will not stand for injustice at all. And that we have to be um, recognized for quality and for the work that we're putting forth and not about our sex, gender, color, or whatever else we bring to the table, that's a perception and the implicit bias that we all have. We're all biased and we all must take implicit bias training on a regular basis, not just once, but on a regular basis to keep our brains to um, rewire itself uh, into the correct path to the correct highways rather than the highways that have been placed there since we were born. And so as a result, I founded Women as One, which is a not-for-profit organization completely devoted to this cause of um, promoting talented women and giving them the opportunities, the opportunities for uh, escalation, for climbing, for leadership, and for recognition. And um, I think it's been a really, really great, fantastic movement. And we thank everyone who's been tremendous. I see many on this um, and who are here today. I, I noticed some of our Escalator Award winners on this, uh, on this. Every dollar that comes to Women as One goes back to women talented women. And boy, our talent directory has grown over 1,500 women. So if you are looking for any woman who, need, you know, you go, oh, well, we don't know any women who are experts in hypertension. Well, I got them. Just please send me a note. I'll send you 20 women, 30 women, hundreds of women who know, uh, who are experts in those fields. And we're doing a lot of work on that. And I'm really proud of that because uh, this, the program has grown and we're hoping one day, who does this, that my, uh, the mission of my organization is to remove the word women out of the women as one, because it really should be as one. It should be an organization that's called as one. All of us working towards equality and fair treatment. And of course, everyone, not just because you're a woman should you get 
um, elevated, but because of the talent you bring to the table and the opportunities that need to be given to these talented women so that they can shine to be key opinion leaders, to be principal investigators, to be leading clinical trials. There is no reason why every single sponsor, large pharma and device companies never use women as their principal investigators. And what they do when they choose us, they make sure they pair us with another man. And I think those things need to go away. We need to stand on our own feet and our own talent and be able to lead these uh, important trials or initiatives or whatever it is. And that's really sort of, I believe, what's important to get done before I leave this earth. So Roxana, these are very wonderful words and wonderful actions that you have done. Now, my question is, in the industry, you have the female quote, you know, um, and uh, they assure that they have uh, bigger participation of women in the leading position. Do you think will be this the way for the medicine to go on for promoting women in leadership positions? Yeah, I believe that there are many pathways that we can promote women in leadership positions. We need to give them opportunities and, and allow them to follow their passion, not to be um, uh, dis disenchanted with a field that's unfriendly to a woman who wants yeah. to have a family or to a woman who doesn't want to have a family. It's nobody's business what we want to do as women. And why is it that in job interviews, uh, fellows are being asked, are you planning to be pregnant in the next year? It's nobody's business. And these are the kinds of private and uncomfortable um, situations that women are facing every day. Every day I have an email, every day I have a story. If I were to put up those stories on Twitter, you would all be amazed. Uh, I'd get a lot more followers, but we don't want to do that. We don't want to shame people. What we want to do is educate everyone because I believe wholeheartedly that a lot of what goes on with the microaggressions and the male uh, dominance is actually because they just don't realize it. We're just, we just need to educate them. And, and I think if they knew, they would be horrified that these kinds of things are happening. And that when you ask a question that's so private about a woman's plans for pregnancy, it's just not acceptable and should never happen, but it happens. It happens every day. And so we just need to continue educating our wonderful male colleagues. I could tell you one thing, most, most of my mentors, most of my mentors, because I have a hundred mentors, by the way, and I tell this to all the women, mentorship is not a one-off thing. Oh, I have one mentor who's going to take me through. That's too much of a big responsibility. There are great people who could mentor you in all different kinds of parts of life. And most of my mentors and those who have given me opportunities are men because they're the ones in the powerful positions. So it's really important to understand the, um, the importance of these amazing men who are out there, who are, um, who are great mentors. I certainly were very, very lucky to have them. You know, Valentin Fuster, Marty Leon, Milton Packer. I just could go on, Arnold Katz. I could just go on and on about these amazing, amazing men who have been my mentors all these all these years. Thanks, Roxana. Roxana, thank you also for the passion in your voice, <laughs> which is really involving. Uh, another question on this issue. I have noted a recent publication uh, you co-authored. Uh, the title is Sex Differences in Cardiovascular Research, a Scientometric Analysis. What is the, what are the main results of this Scientometric Analysis? Yeah, I mean, you know, we what we want to do is in all of the um, all of these uh, publications is to kind of just point out um, the the, um, the the biases as well as the the sex specific differences in whether it's publication bias, whether it's um, you know why is it that some of these, uh, for example, female authors, if there are female authors, they don't make it to the big journals, they make it to the to the lower impact factor journals and all those things. So we are really, really looking at, um, uh, and, and 
trying to make an important assessment that uh, that uh, there these um, disparities exist, and we as long as if you don't talk about them, not nothing will be done about about this. And I don't know that we have all the solutions, Professor Crea, but we certainly when you when you talk about it, I think you were also very very surprised, right? And and wow, why is this happening? I think we had dinner together, and you were just. Yeah. You were mortified because you sometimes you're just not informed. And I think it's important for us to hear our voices and to hear our um, our plea. And I think that's important. And I think the other thing I, I want to make sure that um, there I see on there um, uh, some questions that I think are great, especially about pregnancy related complications, such an important field of cardio obstetrics. Uh, and what we did in the past when women got preeclampsia, preterm birth, gestational diabetes, once they gave birth, they were forgotten about. And then 20 years later, they showed up with severe multivessel disease and horrible, uh, you know, HEFPEF of HEFREF of all those things that we saw that is probably has an association with, um, with evaluation of these pregnancy related complications. And that field now is growing tremendously. I think it's a great opportunity for us to make important impact and get in there. The other thing is that there are many women who are surviving their horrific cancers at a young age, lymphomas, breast cancer, but then they're dying of heart disease because um, we don't realize that connection of cancer and cardiovascular disease and inflammation and, and the cardiotoxicity of some of these drugs that these women have had to endure for treatment of their cancers and radiation and calcification and aortic stenosis. And then lastly, I wanna talk about LP little a, another very, very important lipoprotein that is, may have an important role more so in women than in men. We just don't know, we have to study it. Uh, but there is uh, this uh, very interesting relationship with aortic stenosis, women and LP little a. And now there's something to be done about LP little a, hopefully in the future coming. So, so much great things uh, for us and so much opportunity for us to intervene from the time of inception to the end of the life of a, of a woman. There is time, it's never too late and it's never too early to think about heart disease in women. Well, in the meantime, Roxana, I'm reading some wonderful comments from our audience. They are very enthusiastic about the, uh, the way you are discussing this important uh, issue. Well, I'm reading Harriet Nielsen uh, and uh, Bianca, <laughs> D'Antono, Bianca D'Antono, Lizzie Brewster. I mean, the beauty of the post-COVID era at this virtual meeting, which are really global meetings. So all these comments, all these enthusiastic comments are coming from the five continents. And this is the magic of, uh, of having this virtual world. Of course, we love shaking hands. We want to come back to live meetings, but also this opportunity of virtual meeting, embracing the full world, embracing the five continents is something which is very exciting. So really ex very enthusiastic comments from our audience. But uh, Roxana, uh, we, uh, we still have time for some few, quest few questions. Uh, one, back to science, what are the major studies in your pipeline? Can you share with us? Yes, um, I'm very, very, um, very fortunate. Uh, uh, to, be, to be working on several clinical trials right now. Um, uh, first and foremost, we have a, a huge study on diabetic patients at the moment, 3,000 patients to be randomized between two stent platforms uh, to deal with this uh, very big issue of reach stenosis in diabetic patients. So um, we have a new stent platform uh, by Concept Medical where the, the, the drug and um, the drug is um, placed on the stent after it's crimped on the balloon. So both the stent and the balloon will have some drug coating. And, uh, and this is a prospective randomized clinical trial, 3000 patients, it's called AbilityDM. It's mostly in Europe and Asia. 
and it's going up against the best in class design stent. Uh, we're running the study here with Marie Claude Maurice over at Cirque, and uh, we're very lucky to be at 1,500 randomized patients. I'm also extremely lucky to be part of the executive committee of the Aegis II trial, which is one of the largest studies looking at the um, APOA1, a synthetic APOA1 injection after an acute coronary syndrome with four, four infusions in these patients uh, immediately after an acute coronary syndrome um, and uh, with, with a hope of uh, improving the cholesterol efflux and hopefully reducing early clinical events after an acute coronary syndrome. This is a 25,000 plus patient study. We're almost uh, at about 15,000 patients enrolled. Uh, it's a multinational, multi-center multi, multi -center, uh, study. And it's obviously for, uh, for, this, um, uh, uh, for this drug that CSL um, has, uh, has put, CSL bearing has put forth. And it's CSL112 is the agent. And then um, I'm working uh, with uh, some of the great leaders on um, the PCSK9 inhibitor in Clisaran, uh, hopefully a very large prospective uh, study in high-risk patients uh, uh, to, to, uh, to be included over 15,000 patients or so uh, that we will hopefully launch. And I'm working on that. Uh, the Inclisiran, as you know, is a PCSK9 inhibitor that will only require a twice month, twice yearly injection. And as everyone knows, the Orion study is already going on um, uh, with our uh, with our colleagues at Oxford, which is an investigator initiated working with. Uh, but this is uh, this is uh, completely uh, with uh, Novartis, who's who's uh, working on that. And then uh, I'm very involved in the entire program of. Factor 11, uh, which is a factor 11 inhibitor, which is sort of a new way of hopefully reaching that sweet spot of uh, reducing ischemic events without too much bleeding. And so that's a whole program uh, that I'm uh, very, very lucky to be part of the executive committee of that. And then I'm also working on, on the small annulus study, which will have mostly women, 90% women with aortic stenosis, um, of going between the two stent platforms, balloon expandable, uh, balloon expandable um, valve versus uh, the uh, self-expanding valves and trying to see which one of these valves could have the best durability and the best hemodynamics and the best results in the small annulus, which is mostly seen in women. So here's a way that you could enroll a lot of women. If you find a condition that is more prevalent in women, you will have mostly women. So we went after the small annulus where we're seeing a lot of recurrence. So we wanna know what's the best valve. So you basically do a randomized study in small annulus. And Jolinda will tell you that that will be about 80 to 90% women. So now uh, we will have a trial that has mostly women. So we can do these things and be creative about our trial designs to be able to enroll uh, more women. We're, I'm also working on several other um, first in man studies, as well as um, several other studies that have to do with um, acute kidney injury and prevention. And uh, we will be presenting our new and improved risk score, um, which should be simultaneously published in a very nice journal um, uh, at the American Heart Association. So we're looking forward for, for that and then hopefully other important ones. And then of course, I'm uh, on the steering committee of a, of a trial named SOS AMI, which is a, um, a, a very large prospective study of an injectable P2Y12 inhibitor that we leave up to the patient to self-inject when they're having their uh, post-ACS recurrent myocardial infarction or recurrent ACS which I think I'm most excited about because I think we're moving towards pragmatic um, clinical trials. And then there are several other ones that I'm hoping to, um, to work with um, in, in multiple teams and across disciplines. So we'll be very, very busy for the next few years. Well, Roxana, this is a wonderful range of studies, of course. 
the European art journal is interested in what, in what you do. Uh, when, when I read your name among the others, I always read the paper with a lot of attention. Thank you. Uh, it's really quite impressive. Although I noticed that before you said first in main study, uh, well, you know, uh, come spontaneous should it be first in human beings or whatever. First in human, first in human. First in human. That's a mistake. No, so not, Thank okay. you. That was first your mistake. First in human studies <laughs> and all no, from, about human health. Thank you for correcting me. See, I told you we're all biased. Yeah. Implicit bias training. This is what impressed me. If you if you say first in men means that really there's a lot of work to no, do. No, so no, no. First, first in, in human, human from now. First on. in human. All about first in human. Uh, Roxana, I have from my side one last question. Uh, uh, I, I always ask our guests, uh, what are your suggestions for the future of EHA, EHJ dialogues? We always want to improve. How can we improve? No, I, I think uh, your dialogues are, are amazing. I just have to tell you, I was shocked to be asked to be part of this. So I wanna thank uh, you and Dr. Mahili for, for having me and just so graceful to, and so wonderful and so lovely to be part of this. And I, I really am not deserving of this kind of attention. And I, I really appreciate it. I think it's wonderful that you are bringing more women to have dialogue with because there are amazing female leaders out there. So thank you for doing this. Thank you for shedding light on this important issue. And, um, you know, we can also uh, create new highways in people's brains by having in, a, in an unconscious way, bringing in more women to the dialogues and making sure that they are part of the conversation. And so thank you for doing that because that's how, you know, I was part of, a, I wrote an, um, I wrote the, um, a, a, uh, the prologue to a book um, that's called uh, Deceptively Delicious by Jessica Seinfeld, who is a wife of Jerry Seinfeld. And I, she asked me to write the, um, the preface to the book. And the book is about how do you get kids to eat vegetables? It's like a cookbook that um, basically puts uh, vegetables, hides it in the food, you know, and the, get, the kids get nutrition. So you too can bring a lot of women to the table and uh, continue in helping men understand how brilliant these women in, in cardiology are and can bring uh, more and more uh, to the table. The topics are great that you have chosen, but giving women this kind of a stage is tremendously helpful for them. So thank you for doing that. And um, I hope we can have more of the, it would be great to have a conversation with some emerging female leaders and hearing their experiences now um, and hopefully understanding uh, and shedding light to this important issue. Thank you for doing that, Professor Crea. You're a brilliant, brilliant uh, innovator. Thank you, Roxanne. Definitely will uh, we'll follow your, your important suggestions. Julinda, any final comment from your side, questions or comment or remark? I have no questions. I'm very happy to have Roxana here. It was excellent. Thank you, and thank Julinda. you for inspiring me and the whole generations coming after me. Oh, you inspire thank you, Roxana. You have given me so much advice. So you say I'm your mentor. Mm -hmm. You have mentored me. <laughs> I, I think you are my mentor. It doesn't bit. change. <laughs> I remember receiving the the Grunzik, um, the Grunzik, uh, lecture, and Julinda right before she gave me such good advice uh, to go to the to the to the podium, and I think it helped me so much. Julinda, I will never forget. Um, uh, you, you, what you told me, and I think I'm. I bring that now every day to, uh, to. So thank you for your mentorship and your advice. Thank you. Well, it is now one hour of conversation, <laughs> but when went by so quickly because it's been really very, very involving and entertaining. Well, now uh, this concludes our dialogue, and really, I wish to thank Roxana and Julinda for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you for really uh, sharing your precious time with us. 
and has been really an inspiration for, for all, all the, all the all, for our large audience in the five continents. Uh, I remind Can you, I just say one please, thing before please, we leave? Please because I noticed there are so many women listening. I just want to tell these women, congratulations to you. Keep working, be strong, don't give up, follow your passion. You're amazing and somebody will see it. So just keep working hard. That's what, it's the only thing. And, and never give up and feel good because cardiology is a wonderful, rewarding, rewarding subspecialty. We are so lucky to be cardiologists and you've worked so hard to get here. So don't give up now. Thank you. Well, Roxana, let's close <laughs> on this remark. I'm reading a long <laughs> list of enthusiastic <laughs> comments from our audience, really an impressive list. I cannot, I cannot mention them all, but it is really an impressive list. I remind you that the next dialogue will be as usual on the last Thursday of the month, it will be uh, November 25 at 17 CET. Thank you again, Roxanne and Julinda. Bye, thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much. We'll just wait for all participants to sign off and then I will also conclude the live stream in a quick moment. <laughs>